This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thank you, Neil, for the introduction. And basically today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you all about uh, the work that we've been doing at Purdue with uh, LED lighting. So this is our, uh, our greenhouses at Purdue. And as you can see, our, our LEDs uh, nice and glowing there. Um, so in terms of a floor culture, and you know, we can talk about other crops, um, we tend to really focus on light quantity, light quality, as well as light duration. And with each of these, we can manipulate them to um, have our crops do specific things. So with light quantity, you know, we, ha we primarily use uh, high pressure sodium or metal halide lamps to increase the uh, daily light integral. With light quality, we can use filters or shading. And then with photo period, primarily growers would use incandescent uh, lamps. Obviously, those are being phased out of production. So um, ultimately, these are the responses that we're looking for. Well, now we have that was good. Sorry. So now we have uh, LEDs, which we can use to basically look at both, uh, well, look at photosynthetic, photomorphogenic, as well as photoperiodic uh, light responses. So one of the primary areas of research for me is lighting of, of young plants. And that is primarily because uh, when we think of northern uh, latitudes, this is what we often see. We see very low light, uh, daily light integrals. And um, for propagators, they really want to minimize the amount of time that those young plants are in the greenhouse. They want to optimize the quality and also uh, just um, you know, reduce that timing. When we think of the photosynthetic daily light integral um, outdoors, in the north, we typically have anywhere from 5 to 20 moles of light. And um, to produce a high quality young plant, research has shown that we want to be more within the 10 to 12 uh, mole range. So when we move within a greenhouse, we can have further reductions of anywhere from 50% or more, uh, or less, excuse me, uh, due to the structures, the glazing material, et cetera, where we can ultimately have a daily light integral within a greenhouse during pro peak uh, propagation of anywhere from 1 to 5 moles, which is is quite low. So these are basically two maps. And we're looking at the average greenhouse daily light integral in February, which is when we're propagating a lot of cuttings and also growing a lot of seedlings. And this is the average greenhouse daily light integral. So you can see that in the north, uh, there's a large benefit in terms of using supplemental lighting to get that target DLI of, of 10 to 12 moles of light. So we've been doing uh, research with rooting of cuttings for several years. This is work that we looked at um, using high pressure sodium lamps. And as you can see, when you increase that daily light integral, you obviously increase that root dry mass, you end up with more branching. So you ultimately can get that cutting out of the uh, production house much faster. So when we look at northern uh, latitudes, especially like say uh, New York, Michigan, Daily light integrals in this range are not uncommon during that time period. This is some work uh, done at Michigan State, and you can see that here what they've done is they basically have looked at when to use high pressure sodium lighting, whether it's early on or later on in terms of the plug production, and you can see the effects of obviously of providing supplemental light during three stages of, of the uh, seedling stage, and uh, ultimately it reduces the time to produce that plug, but also increases the quality. So when we look at biomass production, it's very uh, cultivar dependent. So we see that root dry mass increases with increasing daily light integral. Obviously, each species is, uh, responds differently. We see that uh, photosynthesis also increases as we would expect. So this is what, basically what we're looking at is this is that um, stick. And then we start to see that, um, that daily light, or excuse me, as daily light integral increases, photosynthesis increases. So this leads me to uh, the first study that we're going to talk about. This is some work that my former graduate student, uh, Chris Curry, worked on. He basically wanted to look at supplemental uh, lighting using various sources. So what we did is we basically uh, looked at LEDs where we had 100% red light or, and no uh, blue light. And then we had increasing amounts of blue light from anywhere from 15 to 30%. We also had our, our control, which was our high pressure sodium lamp. And we provided 70 micromoles of, of light for 16 hours each day. So here's our spectral quality for the various LEDs and of course the high pressure sodium. So uh, you can see our, 
our different peaks. And this is basically uh, what we found. So we have our high pressure sodium and our increasing amount of blue light from uh, zero all the way up to 30. And what's the, the one thing that you notice between both the impatience and the petunia? In terms of uh, above and below a ground uh, biomass. Yeah, exactly. There, there were there were virtually no differences. So um, that was, I guess, you know, it depends on on who you're talking with, uh, whether that's good or bad. So we also looked at uh, photosynthesis for the the three species, and basically we had the same photosynthetic rates under high pressure sodium lamps, or under 100% red, or um, with increasing amounts of blue light. So what we did is then we grew the plants under a common environment. So we took them out of propagation and we placed them into a greenhouse with 20 degrees Celsius and a target daily light integral of 10 to 12 moles of light. And we finished them to see if there were any residual effects of uh, basically propagating them under high pressure sodium lamps or LEDs. And again, we did not see any difference in time to flower, height at flower, nodes below the first flower. So really, um, some of the conclusions that we were able to make from this study is that there were very few statistical differences among the cuttings um, when we used various sources of supplemental light. And there obviously there were few differences among flowering plant responses. So there were no beneficial or detrimental effects of using LEDs for uh, vegetative propagation. So our next study, uh, we wanted to basically look at seedlings. So we think of a cutting. And when we get a cutting, you know, it obviously comes from either uh, Central or South America or, or Africa. And we, that cutting spends about a week in the greenhouse, forming callus. And then it's in the greenhouse anywhere from two to three weeks more. When we have a seedling, that seedling, we place it under lights uh, right after germination. And it's in the greenhouse anywhere from three to four weeks. So we basically had uh, similar lights, so 100% red, um, 85% red, 15% blue, and then the 70 and 30. We had a different, uh, or different LEDs that we used in this <coughs> study, and we increased our um, light intensity to 100 micromoles for 16 hours a day. Again, here's our uh, spectral distribution for the various LEDs, as well as the high-pressure sodium lamps. And we used a wide variety of bedding plants. So these are basically the top 10 bedding plants that are produced uh, in the US. I'm just going to present to you today uh, the petunia just because of, of time. But with the uh, seedlings, we definitely saw dramatic differences between those that were produced under LEDs versus uh, the high pressure sodium lamps. So here what we're looking at is uh, the stem length. So with plugs, we want them to be nice and compact, right? Because we're going to, one uh, grower is going to produce them, place them in a box, and ship them to another grower. So we want these, these plugs to be nice and compact. So you can see that under high pressure sodium lamps, they were much more taller compared to uh, under LEDs. So when we, inc when we used blue light, we tended to have even more compact seedlings. When we looked at stem caliper, uh, there were basically no differences. So in terms of stem caliper, we want a sturdy seedling that's going to be able to withstand uh, transportation, not break in that box. In terms of root dry mass, obviously root dry mass is important because if those seedlings root faster, they're going to be um, rooted into that uh, plug tray. So there were basically not a whole lot of um, differences. The only differences were, were between the 85% 85, um, 85 red, 15% blue, and the 70-30. Uh, again, with shoot dry mass, not a lot of difference as well. So again, we wanted to grow these plants out in a common environment, see if there were any residual effects of the supplemental lighting during propagation. And as you can see here, they pretty much all flowered um, at very similar times, so there were no statistical differences, as well as the height at flower. So we found that plug quality was similar, um, whether the seedlings were grown under high-pressure sodium lamps or under LEDs, or in some instances, they were uh, of better quality. And the finished plant quality was not significantly influenced by the uh, propagation supplemental lighting. So then this led to the next study where uh, there's been an interest by uh, US growers of producing plugs indoors. So we wanted to look at 
whether we could produce a high quality bedding plant seedling indoors using sole source lighting versus producing a plug in a greenhouse. So what we did is, is we maintained a 23 degree constant day and night temperature and we wanted to achieve a daily light integral of about 10 and a half moles. So in the greenhouse, we wanted to achieve that with sunlight plus supplemental lighting and in the uh, grow chamber, we wanted to achieve that just with sole source LEDs. So these are the uh, different treatments that we had in the greenhouse. So we had a no supplemental lighting control. And we decided, we didn't, obviously in the two previous studies, we didn't have a ambient control. And that was something that uh, when I talk to growers, I obviously have an extension appointment, they often don't realize the benefits of using supplemental light. So I wanted to really you know, show them that there are differences. Um, and then in terms of our supplemental lighting treatments, those lights were on for 16 hours. We provided 70 micromoles. And we had a high pressure sodium lamp. We also used plasma lamps. And then we had um, one um, LED treatment. So we had one that had 88% red and 12% blue light. In the grow chambers, we looked at two light qualities. So we had the same as in the greenhouse. And then we had another treatment that had 18% um, more blue light. So these are our various uh, treatments. So we had our high pressure sodium, our greenhouse LEDs, and then our plasma in the greenhouse, and then here are our two sole source lighting uh, treatments. So we, we did a multi-layer production. Here's our uh, spectral distribution for the various uh, light treatments. And this was probably, uh, in terms of the studies that we did with um, young plants, you can definitely see that there are some major differences between the plants that are produced in the greenhouse, so the ambient, high pressure sodium, plasma, and then this uh, supplemental LEDs. You can see the, the differences between those that were produced in the greenhouse versus the ones that were produced under sole source uh, LEDs. So let's look at the data a little closer. So those that were produced under plasma lamps were, were quite elongated compared to uh, the other supplemental lighting treatments as well as under sole source lighting. We also found that the relative chlorophyll content, so we used, basically used a SPAD meter and um, as you provided supplemental light or sole source light, we definitely saw that the relative uh, chlorophyll con content increased, but a, a big increase under sole source lighting. In terms of leaf area, um, leaf area increased when you provided, obviously, more light. Um, in terms of root dry mass, as we would expect, uh, compared to the ambient control, and the one thing I forgot to mention is the ambient um, treatment, we had about six and a half moles of light, and that was obviously from the sun, and then we were providing an additional four moles from, from the supplemental lighting. So we saw an increase in terms of our root dry mass, but the highest occurred under sole source lighting. And then we had an increase in shoot dry mass, but it was relatively sim similar between uh, the various lighting treatments. So again, we finished uh, the crop under a common environment to see if there were any residual effects. And here is where we, we did see some differences. And one of the differences that you see is obviously petunias are a long day plant, so they require long days in order to flower. So under our ambient conditions in the winter, uh, after three weeks, uh, they had not flowered. Plasma lamps um, provide quite a bit of heat, so that obviously helped in terms of time to flower. The high pressure soda, there is a flower bud there, it's, it's hard to see. But here, what we can see is that um, when we had only 12% um, blue light, basically we were providing about 22 micromoles of blue light. There was a delay in terms of time to flower. Not a significant delay, but um, work that's been done at Michigan State has actually shown that you can use blue light to, um, in, uh, basically use blue light instead of far red light to induce flowering responses in, in floriculture crops. So we're actually going to do some more work in this area uh, this coming uh, winter. So in terms of, of time to flower, you definitely see that, the, uh, that there were differences. Height at flower, in terms of horticulturally, uh, those differences were not very uh, significant. So we found in this study that the quality of bedding plant seedlings uh, produced under uh, sole source, excuse me, supplemental lighting was similar or greater to those grown under ambient light. Also seedlings of the species that we studied um, were of higher quality or similar quality when they were grown under sole source lighting when we compared those to supplemental. 
And the only two species where we found that there was a difference in time to flower was uh, impatience and the petunia that I showed you today. So uh, we believe that sole source lighting is, is a viable option for growers who would like to produce uh, bedding plant seedlings indoors uh, because they can obviously control the parameters, not only the light, but also temperature, uh, humidity, and carbon dioxide, which is uh, going to produce uniform cuttings, or excuse me, uniform seedlings throughout uh, the peak production um, cycle. This is a study that uh, we basically just finished up a few weeks ago. I actually just got the data, data from my uh, student uh, a few days ago. So Josh, uh, well there's two Joshes, but Josh Garavac wanted to look at uh, producing microgreens indoors um, and he wanted to basically look at both light quantity as well as light quality. So uh, we had three species uh, that we looked at. We used uh, basically a fiber hydroponic tray. It's a, it's a pad and I'll show you a little bit later. And our um, environmental set points were 21 during the day, 17 at night. And then we maintained a relative humidity of, of 50 during the day and 60 at night. And then we had a, a set point of 500 parts per million CO2. In terms of the LEDs that we used in this study, we used the, the same LEDs that, we've, uh, that I've showed you in the previous study. But we had an LED on this one that had um, far red light. And then this one had uh, green light. And we achieved three uh, target daily light integrals. So we basically wanted to have a low DLI uh, and then increase that amount to, uh, from 6 to 12 and then 18. And these uh, lamps were on for uh, 16 hours a day. So here's our various uh, LEDs. So you can see the, uh, what they look like and obviously what the microgreens look like under the LEDs. So you can see that when we have the, the green and blue, uh, you can actually see the, the actual color of, of the microgreens. So here's our uh, spectral distribution for the various uh, treatments. Obviously, as, as you increase that intensity, uh, you see that the peaks also increase. <coughs> it's a little bit, it might be a little bit difficult for you to, uh, to see this from the back, but what's the one major difference that you notice when you increase um, the daily light integral? Okay, I hear Bill. Bill basically uh, said the answer there. So, so this is something that we have noticed. Uh, uh, when you increase the amount of blue light, we, uh, we actually noticed this on geraniums. So you think of a zonal geranium and, and you know the, the zonal part. When we increase that amount of blue light, we saw an increase in anthocyanins. Here, we're basically, we're, what, in the 11 to 12% range in terms of blue light, but with an increased daily light integral, whether you had far red or green light, you definitely see uh, an increase in, in anthocyanins. Here's another species. This is a kohlrabi, a species that not, doesn't necessarily show the red pigmentation or anthocyanins. And here we're basically looking at those microgreens. So you see that under a low daily light integral, it doesn't really matter in terms of the light quantity as you would expect, they're much more elongated. But it really depends on the market, right? Some individuals might want microgreens that are a little, a little bit taller, others may not. With that increased daily light integral, we see that they're much more compact, and also we see that expression of, of anthocyanins. So let's look at the, some, uh, let's look at the data. So obviously, those, those, yep. those were all done at one temperature, right? Yes, Whatever yes. That's mm -hmm. Exactly. So here we're looking at the hypocotyl length. So we've got our, our basically our three light uh, quantities and our increasing daily light integral from 6 to 18 moles. So as we increase our daily light integral, the hypocotyl length decreases on, in terms of leaf area. The more light we provide them, the smaller the leaf area. So is that a good or a bad thing? Well, in terms of, of microgreens, what, are, what is it that we're ultimately uh, trying to achieve, right? More biomass, uh, and so that might not necessarily be a good thing where we have a, a decrease in leaf area. Here we have uh, percent dry weight, so obviously increasing uh, 
light quantity, we have an increase in dry weight. In terms of light quantity, there were really no differences. Um, here we're looking at the relative chlorophyll content. So again, some slight increases with increased uh, daily light integral. But really, this is, I think, one of the ni uh, nice things is we looked at total anthocyanins. And you can definitely see that with that increased light quantity, there's definitely a, a difference in the total anthocyanins. And this is for the kohlrabi. We, if we would have looked at the other species that uh, definitely has a dark, darker foliage, we probably would have seen more dramatic of a difference. When we looked at total phenolics, there were virtually no differences between uh, those light quanti different light quantities and light qualities. So this leads us to another study. Um, this is uh, Garrett Owen, and he's been working in, on this for about a year now. Um, one of the things that uh, we typically tend to notice when we go to production greenhouses, especially in March and April, is you see a lot of this. You know, there's a lot of hanging baskets and then obviously crops growing below. Well, Penicetum rubrum, uh, purple fountain grass, is a very popular um, ornamental grass. One of the problems, however, is that because growers have such, uh, well, especially in the north, uh, low light levels and then you put hanging baskets above them, you're really reducing that daily light integral. And so often, uh, these grasses are actually green. They're not very purple. Um, you know, you take a, a closer look, and this is purple fountain grass, but you wouldn't know that if, if you were just looking at it in, in a garden center or in a greenhouse. Um, so obviously, color is a key component. Um, consumers obviously buy purple fountain grass because it's purple. They want to have, add some color into their landscape as well as when we think of uh, red leaf lettuce. So often when you go into a greenhouse and they're not providing supplemental light, their red leaf lettuce is green. And so in terms of color, obviously it's attributed to chlorophyll, carotenoids, flavonoids, um, and, uh, and anthocyanins. This is um, purple fountain grass that's been cut back. It was grown in a greenhouse, in a glass glazed greenhouse during the summer. And you can obviously see the, the increased uh, anthocyanins. So, as I mentioned before, with the addition of blue light, we've noticed uh, that you can uh, increase anthocyanin production. And obviously there has, had been some work that had uh, showed this previously. So we thought of, of uh, a new concept. It was basically called end of production supplemental lighting. So let's say a grower produces their lettuce or their penicetum under the same conditions they always do, but they light the crop at the end. So let's say anywhere from one to two weeks before they're gonna ship that crop out, they can increase the color, enhance the quality. So uh, we thought of a, a way of, of quantifying this by using a, uh, a portable meter. This is a meter that's often used in the food industry to measure color. Um, so what we did is, is with the um, penicetum is we start off with plugs that were grown in uh, New Hampshire. So you can definitely see how uh, light uh, and color they are, not much uh, purple pigmentation. We grew those out to, uh, for about 55 days. And in order to uh, create the daily light integral that we would have during uh, peak production, which would be um, March, April, we had a daily light integral about six moles. This is the daily light integral that we would find under those, those hanging baskets. Um, we then basically place the plants under um, end of production lighting. So I'm going to show you the different treatments. Our daily light integral basically from the sun was uh, close to nine moles of light. And these are the various treatments. So we had a control, photoperiodic control, that's, which gave us about four micromoles of light. Then we had a treatment where we had 100% uh, red, a combination of 50, 50 red and blue. Again, our 88, 12, and then we had 100% uh, blue at 25, 50, or 100 micromoles. So here's our, our spectral quality for the various uh, treatments. And here we're looking at the, um, the lettuce grown under the 50, 50 red and blue LEDs, 100%, or excuse me, yes, 100% blue LEDs, and here we have the, the penicetum. Here's at night, so you can actually see uh, uh, the LEDs and how the, uh, the lettuce looks quite dark, but I'll show you what it actually looked like. 
So these are basically um, using that uh, colorometer. We looked at the L star, the A star, and the B star, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. So basically, the, the L star is a measure of lightness. So um, as you get closer to zero, whatever that uh, meter is measuring is more on the, uh, towards uh, black. The no as the number increases towards 100, it's more white. In terms of what we were looking for was more of this red-green. So a positive A star told us the, f the pigments were obviously more red. And in terms of B star, whether there was a, a tendency of, of the pigments uh, turning more blue. So we took measurements on day one, basically when those plants were placed under end of production lighting, and then at three, five, seven, 14, and 21 days. So this is what th our plants look like. So this was about two weeks, or three weeks, excuse me, uh, before a, a grower would typically ship out the plant toward, to a garden center or um, retail greenhouse. So these are our initial uh, measurements in terms of the L uh, star, A star, and B star. And this is after seven days of end of production lighting. So here, again, the L star is a measure of lightness from white to black. So our control, you can see, um, was about 31.1. And we saw a decrease in that number when we had a combination of both red and blue light, as well as when we provided 100 micromoles of blue light alone. If we light the crop for yet another week, we see that obviously um, the plants are, are obviously much darker in color, and we see, a, a, again, a decrease in that L star. What about the A star? Well, a negative means green, a positive means blue, so as we go from the control to a 50-50 combination of red and blue, or 100 micromoles of blue. We obviously see that number is, is more positive. And now visually, we can see that, but we wanted to quantify that. And if we add another week, we see that that number definitely increases. So the longer we have those uh, plants under that end of production, red or blue, or 100% blue, um, we definitely saw a difference. And then here, we're looking at the B star. So this is a change from. Um, yellow to blue. So again, um, control was 6.2. We see that that number has decreased, so we're becoming more blue. And again, as we increase the, uh, the time. So here's a visual close-up of, this is after 21 days of end of production lighting, and we're looking at individual uh, leaf blades. So that 50-50 combination, or the 100, mi uh, 100 micromoles of blue, we definitely see that those blades have, have colored up. And the really interesting thing is, if you uh, were to pick up, let's say we had two leaf blades that were like this. If you were to pick this one up, it would be green underneath. So it's, it's really only those uh, leaves that are, that are receiving that higher intensity of, of uh, blue light are actually, uh, the anthocyanins are increasing in those leaves. So here's a close up. This is uh, 14 weeks later, so you can definitely see the difference in terms of, of the uh, color. We also looked at a cultivar of geranium. This one has a really dark foliage. It's called black velvet. And again, you can see that uh, 100 micromoles of, of blue light or a combination of, uh, this is just 100% red, or a, or a combination of red and blue definitely increases the, the pigmentation. We also wanted to look at lettuce, as I mentioned before. Um, red leaf lettuce growers often have a challenge under low light conditions of, of actually having it uh, be. A so these are all red leaf lettuce cultivars, but you would not know that because they were obviously grown under a low DLI of six moles. So again, we looked uh, similar treatments, and again, here's the L star. You can definitely see after seven days um, that number has decreased. Really, with the lettuce, five days was enough to uh, get it to go from basically green to a nar nice dark red. Here's our A star. You definitely see that number has, has increased quite a bit, as well as our B star. So with our uh, penicetum, we found that anywhere from 7 to 14 days of end of production lighting, uh, whether we provided a combination of red or blue light or 
uh, 100 percent blue light at 100 micromoles was effective um, at increasing the uh, pigmentation change in color. And with the um, red leaf lettuce, uh, five to seven days was enough. Um, again, using the same uh, two treatments. And the last study that I'm going to uh, talk about today is basically looking at, um, so obviously here we're looking at the photoperiodic responses. So um, the greenhouse industry typically uses uh, incandescent bulbs to induce flowering. Um, so we can obviously cl classify a lot of our greenhouse floriculture crops as day neutral, uh, short day, as well as long day. In order to schedule these crops into spe for specific market dates, um, we can use photo period. The typical uh, things that growers will use is either a night interruption, so they basically will turn on these lamps um, from, let's say, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. to interrupt the night, and basically uh, the plants perceive a long day. Or they can use day extension lighting, where at sunset they'll turn on the lights for a specific amount of time to provide a long day. So, um, you know, these are, are various treatments that growers can use. Here we have a point, poinsettia crop, so they're using uh, blackout cloth to obviously provide a short day to induce the crop in a flower, or here they're using um, day extension. So as I said before, incandescent bulbs have been used for, for many years. Uh, they emit a relatively low amount of red light and a high amount of far red light, obviously uh, far red light is what's needed in order to induce uh, flowering. They're very electrically inefficient, only about 6% efficiency, um, short lifespan, and obviously they're being phased out of production. So what, is, what are growers going to use? Well, there's our, our next alternative is the compact fluorescent lamp. The only problem with these lamps is they emit a high amount of red light and a relatively low amount of far red light. Um, with certain species like wave petunias, which have a, a high response in terms of their, uh, or in terms of, of light for long day response, um, they flower, um, it's delayed basically under compact fluorescent lamps. The life of CFLs is also reduced by the number of times that they're turned on and off, which can be a problem. And of course, they contain mercury, which um, has some serious disposal issues. High pressure sodium lamps can also be used for photoperiodic lighting. Uh, you can use them for cyclical lighting, um, but of course they're energy intensive, they're expensive, and they emit heat. So we have LEDs. Uh, with LEDs, as I've showed you, we have different uh, light qualities that we can use. Um, they have a longer operating life. The spectra can be tailored uh, based on what, whatever response we're looking for, whether it's, um, as I showed you before, a photomorphogenic response or a photoperiodic response. The only problem is the cost. So these are commercially available uh, LED lamps that are now on the market. So what does an incandescent bulb cost? For a, a four pack, I think you could probably get them for about $2. And, uh, CFL. Not very much. These are about fifty dollars. So, in terms of the the life, you know, they they can last many many years. I believe the estimate is about fifty thousand hours. But of course, you know, growers, in order to get them to to switch over to these, uh, that's a big investment. So what we did is we looked at a wide variety of both long day and short day plants, and we wanted to. Um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we basically had an automatic blackout curtain system, so we um, had a nine-hour base photo period, which was from the sun, which was from 8 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m., and then we provided high-pressure sodium, uh, or increased the daily light integral with high-pressure sodium lamps, which gave us about 70 micromoles at plant height. Um, we had a common greenhouse environment for bedding plant production. And the one thing that we wanted to look at were the responses under low daily light integral versus high, di uh, high daily light integral. We created, um, so we used day extension, so we had a 10 hour photo period of 13 or 16 hours, where basically the lamps were on for either one, four, or seven hours. And the first lamp basically contained red light, white light, and far red light. And this lamp 
only contained red and white, so no far red. But one thing that we had been hearing from growers, especially growers in the south or on the west coast, was that they could use this uh, red and white lamp and basically they would have a flowering response. Where growers in the north would say that they could not use this, these lamps, only these. So what's, what's the one thing in terms of using far red light that, uh, I obviously told you the benefits in terms of flowering, but what's one of the negative drawbacks of the far red? Stem elongation. So that's, that's a bad word in, in the greenhouse industry. Um, so here's our, our photoperiodic lighting. We were providing, um, we wanted to provide two micromoles of, of photoperiodic light because that's what a grower would, would typically provide. So we actually had to use a screen over these lamps because our system is, is quite low. And you can see that um, we, we only place plants where they would receive two micromoles and not near or directly underneath those lamps. So here's our, our um, pansy crop. You can see we achieved a daily light integral of about six moles. Here we have our LEDs that had red, white, and far red light. So this is a long day plant. So under a 10 hour photo period, you see that it took 61 days to flower. When we provided 16, a 16 hour photo period, we reduced that by nearly three weeks. So if you're really, you know, if you're trying to schedule this crop into flower, um, obviously uh, providing long days is, is gonna reduce that time to flower. What about <clears throat> under just red and white light? Well, you can see that there's basically no statistical difference. So under a low daily light integral, uh, even though we were providing long days, the crop was delayed by uh, quite a bit compared to when we use far red light. So again, the negative drawback of using that far red light is there was an increase in stem elongation when we compared those crops that were grown under red, white, far red, versus just red and white light alone. So here's our pansy, or excuse me, petunia crop. Um, relatively low daily light integral under six moles of light. You can see that as you increase your photo period, there's a, a reduction in time to flower. Of course, there's that negative drawback in terms of that stem elongation because of that far red light. Under just red and white light, the crop, whether it was grown under a short day or a long day, flowered uh, basically at the same time. Again, we see the, the difference in height, <clears throat> and there's definitely differences between the two LEDs. Here's a Snapdragon, again, a delay under short days and a delay when we use just red and white light. So this uh, coming summer, we're gonna do the work where we're gonna look at a higher daily light integral and see if um, our hypothesis is that growers in the south and in the west coast, one of the reasons they can use these red and white LEDs is that they're getting enough far red light because they have such a high daily light integral versus in the north. So again, those height differences. And here, uh, what we're looking at is a short day plant. So marigolds are a short day plant. They're a facultative short day plant. You can see that when we grow them under short days, they flower faster um, than under long days. Eventually, obviously, they will flower under long days. So here we have a daily light integral of about eight moles and here 15 moles. You can see that there's uh, not a lot of difference in terms of the short days, but we are gonna look at this um, with long day plants this coming summer when we can really achieve these high daily light integrals. So some of the conclusions from this study is that under low DLL, low DLI, low intensity LEDs with far red light, obviously, they increase stem elongation, but they hasten flower, uh, time to flower for long day plants. Under low DLI, the uh, LEDs that ha did not have far red light, uh, obviously there was reduced stem elongation, but there was a delay in time to flower. So in terms of growers in the north, um, they can use these um, LEDs in lieu of, uh, let's say, a compact fluorescent or an incandescent, and they can have market ready um, plants. Obviously it's very species dependent in terms of the response. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the following uh, organizations, companies uh, for obviously funding as well as for plant material, fertilizers, et cetera. And with that, uh, I think we have some time for, for some questions.
Uh, basically, the question was, are T5 uh, lamps being used in greenhouses? And were you asking basically for the photoperiodic lighting or for? Oh, no, just in any commercial capacity, because the only place I see them is for, um, uh, is for like uh, house plants and like uh, home gardening and stuff. Okay. So think of the fixture. And so in a greenhouse, when we want to provide, whether it's supplemental or photoperiodic lighting, mm -hmm. we want to get as much sunlight as possible, right? Well, with a fixture for like like a T5, that's a that's a lot of fixture where you're basically blocking out a lot of sunlight. Yeah. And so that's that's one of the reasons why we don't see them in greenhouses, but we do see them in the same road chambers or for uh, indoor production of sure. house plants. Um, the LED fixtures you showed in the last experiment looked like they were Edison base designed for 120 volt uh, fixtures. And uh, if we move to a future where we get away from the backward compatibility, you can make them more affordable. Because there you have your, uh, your power regulation circuitry. You need one per bulb. Uh, and it's, um, if you just forget about the backward compatibility, you, you, can, you can then design your LEDs to be optimal uh, for cost and other properties as well. Yes, yeah, so, so the um, <clears throat> LEDs that I showed in the last experiment, they're basically a, a replacement for an like, incandescent or compact fluorescent where, where they're a screw in type bulb where all of the others, and low, low intensity, so um, yeah, they're, they're basically made to, to replace those lamps where the other lamps that I showed you uh, right now, there are some lamps on the market in terms of the supplemental lighting that are uh, called a, a high pressure sodium replacement, but uh, there's still, I would say, a few years where we're really, it's, it's going to take a while, a while longer to get those HPS, HPS replacements with a high intensity. Have you done any work with analyzing the cost of the, you know, the, the purchase cost of the LEDs versus HPS or fluorescence in the case of chamber lighting? So the question was, have we done any uh, cost comparison in terms of uh, using high pressure sodium versus the LEDs? And so we were, we were part of the USDA uh, SCR, SCRR grant. And there's someone at Purdue who's actually doing that component. So hopefully within this year, we will have all of that. It's taken a lot longer. It's, it was, it's much more difficult than we first uh, anticipated in terms of, of getting the, the data, uh, because he's basically getting the data from all of the researchers to then look at uh, the, the cost and, and uh, you know how long does a grower have to have uh, the LEDs and, and so on. Chris? In your last study, it seemed like stem elongation and flowering response in long day plants were closely coupled. And I wonder if there's any way to break that, that connection, perhaps by cyclic lighting of some sort, so that you're giving, as a, you remember that, at least the theory says that if the last light the plant sees in a day, then if it's red, then the stems will stay short. If it's far red, then the stems will become longer. But I don't know if that also influences the, the for the period response as far as flowering is concerned. So the question was, uh, in, in our studies, we use day extension lighting. And uh, would, what sort of responses would we get with night interruption lighting? And so Eric Runkle at Michigan State, he, has, he is focusing on the night interruption. And um, typically a, a night interruption is four hours. Uh, you can do cyclical lighting, which um, obviously you can reduce the amount of time that you light the crop. And he's actually has found that a four hour night interruption, the birds are, are much more compact than under day extension, as you, as you would expect. Okay. With, with the, the Phillips, I think, the term you use is like production module. Yes. So, so Phillips, I guess, has come up with some recipes of red and blue LEDs that they think work pretty well. Are those generally useful for a wide variety of 
plants or I mean to, to what extent will there need to be optimization for different crops? So <clears throat> from the first studies that we did, we had the 100% red, the 85-15, and then the 70-30. Um, across the, the various Benny plant species, we found that 85-15 was a good combination, you know, when you took everything into account. And the work that they had done in the, in the Netherlands, um, they come, came out with the 88-12, which I showed a lot of the, and so that was a good, um, should I say, uh, basically a good combination of both red and, and blue light that they found with, uh, they were looking primarily at vegetables in, in the Netherlands. And uh, so it, that's a good good combination. Obviously the more blue light you add, the more expensive the picture is going to be. What's the psychological effect of these weird colors? <laughs> so that's, 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 a, study? that's a, a very good question. So uh, if I can get back, uh, well, th this is low intensity, so it really doesn't want, but we're in a, when we are in a growth chamber, uh, this has been shown at, at various places. When you're under LEDs, some people actually get nauseous. I am one of them. <laughs> So, where? for example, yeah, this is in the walk-in chamber. When you walk into the chamber and let's say you're in there for even a minute, you walk out and everything you see is green. <laughs> if I'm in there for more than 15 minutes, I feel nauseous when I come out and there's a lot of people that say the same thing. So that, that is definitely a problem. Um, the, can't really see it in there. These are more of a red and white, and those don't really bother uh, your eyes nearly as much as when you have the, the blue light alone, or, or excuse me, red and blue light. So the addition of the green light or a phosph phosphorus coating on the LEDs definitely helps out a lot. So um, we, we are going to be doing more studies with white light, and uh, I think for humans that's definitely going to uh, be a better um, thinking in terms of those of us that get nauseous under them. You lose, you lose Maybe instead of recruiting in grad schools, you, could, you should go to the dance clubs to look for you. <laughs> 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 I have a question from here, kind of on the hardware. Uh, you talked a little bit earlier about how much more flexibility you have in the geometry of the layouts so that it doesn't block light, that sort of thing. Um, what kinds of things might we expect in terms of the geometry of where the lights are placed so you get the right light distribution and they're not in the way for other things you're trying to do? <laughs> so that is one thing with the uh, LED. We think of a high pressure sodium versus an LED. So a high pressure sodium, we tend to have more of the light you know, spreads out with where LEDs, it's very directional. So um, a lot of the LEDs that are on the market, you have to have them relatively close to the crop in order to get uh, a uniform light intensity. Uh, some of the newer, uh, higher intensity ones that, that are quoted as the HPS replacement, uh, they're getting better because they're concentrating more LEDs in, uh, let's say, an area this big. And so you're getting, uh, you can place them higher and you're getting that increased uniformity. But one thing that I tell growers when they ask me about supplemental light is I say, wait. They're really interested in the technology, uh, but I, I tell them, if I were you, I would wait. And if, there's, if they still want to uh, go into LEDs, I tell them to, to look at the various, because there's so many LEDs on the market, there's a lot of claims that are sometimes a little outrageous, so uh, just tell them to do studies on their own and, and see which one best fits their particular situation. So you can get the white LEDs in rolls embedded in this uh, clear silicone-like stuff. They're not very expensive, they're pretty bright, very flexible, literally, but also in terms of installation. Is that one of the hardware implementations you think we might see for supplemental lighting? Well, the thing you, you need to think about with LEDs is that the life of the LED is dependent on the temperature. And so uh, in a greenhouse, you know, especially where we're in a mouthpiece, uh, it's definitely gonna have an effect on how long those LEDs are going to last. And so the method of cooling is very important. Uh, 
Um, so with, with a system like that, um, yeah, I mean, they, they can be relatively cheap, but you're probably going to have to replace them quite a bit. And I'm not sure what sort of uh, you know intensity you would actually um, receive. But therefore, you're also taking the 20, 25 percent loss of any decrement. Yes. Yeah, so the first LEDs that I showed, um, we had basically a fan on them to, to pull them. And in some instances, uh, those LEDs use more energy than the high pressure sodium. So um, it's the, the method of cooling definitely affects the uh, energy usage. All right, let's thank our speaker for today. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.